Welcome to This Just In, the show bringing you the latest advancements in healthcare, strategy, innovation, and public policy. And now, for the fastest voice in healthcare, here's your host, Justin Barnes. Thank you for tuning in, and welcome to the special summer episode of This Just In Radio. We're broadcasting live from my Atlanta studios. I'm here with Roberta Mullen from Healthcare Now Radio. Welcome to the studio as well, Roberta. Justin, I'm so glad to be here. I'm looking forward to this. But um, but we decided, you know what, let's do a mid-year check-in on where healthcare is headed, innovation, strategy, in public policy. Uh, and it's just an exciting time in our industry, uh, great evolutions across the board. And we're really starting to see some outcomes from technology. We've always had the promises of what technology and innovation can deliver, but we're really starting to see, I call it innovation enabled outcomes. And so excited to get into some of that today. This is my 182nd episode. All right. Beth Friedman, how are you? I'm wonderful, Justin. How are you? Excellent. Another co-founder and CEO, Agency 1022. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. You're also a long-term friend of mine and of my family. And um, But this is your first time in studio and as a guest, correct? It is. I was telling Roberta, I've often been the one interviewing <laughs> and I've watched you interview people at yeah. HIMSS. Yes. But this is the first time where I'm the interviewee. Well, I know how much wisdom and expertise is uh, in your head, so I look forward to my audience hearing a lot of it. Again, um, Beth Friedman, co-founder and CEO of Agency 1022. You're out of Atlanta. We've spoken about just the intellectual capital uh, that we have here in our community. Uh, we're fortunate, all the companies, the institutions, but we just have an amazing eco center, uh, ecosystem here, and you're certainly one of those pillars and foundations. So thank you. Um, so from your perspective, uh, what healthcare or health IT trends are you seeing in the industry? Well, I wanted to focus my time with you today, Justin, on the revenue cycle piece of healthcare. Excellent. I know you've had a lot of speakers on today on the regulatory side on um, you know sort of that patient communication, yes. patient touch piece. But yep. when I attended the uh, Healthcare Financial Management Association Conference, HFMA, this past June, yep. over the summer, there were several key trends that I heard, and they were different than what I've heard before at that same conference. So the first one that I wanted to share with your audience is patient financial experience. So yes. we've been talking about patient experience all day. We've been talking about patient clinical experience for decades. Yes. I really heard the CFOs and the VPs of Revenue Cycle finally get it that patients, that patient's financial journey yes. is uh, is becoming just as important as the patient's care journey. And and it makes sense when you think about it from, you know, pre-registration scheduling, that's a touch point in Revenue Cycle all the way to that last bill. So your patient journey starts and ends, you know, really on that financial side. So a lot of conversation about what they can do to improve the patient's financial journey. Yeah. And I think my audience is grateful to hear your voice right now because literally everybody else except for, well, Bird Blitch really kicked it off. That was, you know, from Patient Co. talking about the patient financial experience. Jeff Brown touched on it a little bit, but we've, a lot of my my guests have been doctors or on the clinical side. And so we've heard the kind of, a lot of the resounding themes, which is what I, I like to pull out themes, but Revenue and cycle and, and payment is at the point we got to pay for all this, right? Uh, and right. we need people paying for all this. That's right. And so it's critically important. So you, this is this is very refreshing uh, that we didn't leave this off of the show, and that's why I mm -hmm. wanted to certainly have you here when you, we were talking, you know, speaking a month ago about having you on, and you brought up what you wanted to speak about. I thought you were is is perfect, and the timing is is excellent because. It is so key. And it's, it's actually near and dear to my heart. I mean, I love the clinical side of the business, mm -hmm. but I also love the payment side and the revenue cycle. And I call it revenue cycle performance because you can optimize our current procedures and our, our, there's so much that we can do on the financial side to bring a, a better experience. Uh, and so I, right. I completely agree. Absolutely. So, um, so we, I mean, anything else that you want to follow on with that or what are the couple of best practices to navigate? Well, that, you or? know, and, uh, speaking, following on from that yes. at HFMA, there was one other trend I wanted to share with Please. your, your, um, audience today, and that's the technology piece. So I saw so much more technology at HFMA this year and being fully integrated yes. into the revenue cycle, into the workflow of the revenue cycle ops folks. So, you know, AI, analytics, uh, propensity to pay, eligibility. I mean, I am seeing so much advancement in the revenue cycle technologies and the integration of that into our workflows. So I think that that is a huge area of focus. There's just no reason why we should be doing things the way we've been doing them in the revenue cycle because we've got so many more advanced technologies that can predict 
you know, it, the payability of a yes. patient. Do that up front. And then that really feeds back into the patient experience because you can manage that patient's account financially knowing so much more than we used to know in the past. So I think the whole bringing technology to the forefront of the revenue cycle process was another huge trend. Yeah, no, and that actually was brought up, um, our good friend Denise Hines brought up the predictive piece of we're getting better in healthcare at that on the clinical side, but now obviously mm-hmm. you, you bring it up and we're getting better at that on the financial side. Correct. You know, which is critically important. Certainly, I mean, we need to predict payment and, and payment strategies there because we're trying to build an organization and you, you've got to have an eye on revenue of where it's coming from and, and the um, collectability of it. Absolutely. And and uh, the biggest sector that I saw focus on at the conference was on the patient pay or the self-pay. You know, um, that is a growing, growing, growing segment of every healthcare organization's AR. Yes. And uh, being able to apply these predictive technologies to that piece of it and then to engage that patient in that financial journey, it's really becoming a, a big trend. That's fantastic. And not even self-pay. Um, the deductibles are so high now. Mm-hmm. The, Correct. The deductibles so high yeah. that that's you're paying most of your health care out of pocket anyway. And that's 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 mm-hmm. the new self-pay, yeah. right? right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. self-pay, we used to think about our homeless and our Medicaids. Right. Now self-pay is folks like me yeah. mm-hmm. who have a high deductible health plan. And when I go in for a procedure, mm-hmm. you know, knowing that I can do a no interest patient loan for that deductible piece, that's huge. Yes. You know, that makes me loyal as a patient. Right. Completely agree. Yeah, I mean, I mean, deductibles. I don't need to tell my audience they're five thousand to seven five hundred dollars. My mine's actually ten five. I think my deductible mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but I only pay a couple hundred dollars a month for healthcare insurance, so it is yeah. phenomenal. But I'll take it. Um, so, what uh, what are a few? What are two or three best practices or strategies that you can you know share with my audience to navigate those trends? Well, we just we just spoke about one. I just brought mm-hmm. one up, and I know your your speaker earlier today, Bird, had um, mm-hmm. patient financing also. Yeah. That has become a must have. Some of the VPs of Revenue Cycle and CFOs I sat with at the conference, they 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 re, they um you know, they reiterated that point that we can't just think about this; we have to have it, and right. we have to do it very well. Yep. Uh, engaging with the patient financing companies and the patient financing programs, so that that's that's a really important strategy yep. for providers to do right now. Yeah, because that actually brings it to another level. So there's 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 Patient pay and self pay, but then patient financing is another component of that. And so I guess, yeah, if you're integrating all of that um, and you can get 0% interest or, or financing, that's fantastic because I haven't even gotten to that side of the house. I, I know I'm aware of companies who will finance it for you, um, and they're a blessing to find for a lot of people because, you know, they can't come up with $3,000 or $5,000 or even $1,000 for mm-hmm. some procedures, but you, we don't want to delay care as we know 50 plus percent of people are delaying care based on, you know, Bird's uh, interview earlier. But um, but uh, but yeah. What I mean, what are some of the products that you've seen out there? So zero percent financing or allowing people to oh, pay yeah. in stages. And, mm-hmm. and, and you know, I I'm all raise my hand. I've used a program like that twice. It's great, and they're fantastic. Sure. Fact, one of our clients here in town, Clear Balance, they um they do a consumer sur- survey every year. And just this past year, I pulled out some of the stats Please. for today's uh, conversation. Ninety-two percent of the patients will return to a provider if payment options are provided. So, again, going into mm. that patient loyalty, patient financial satisfaction. Um, the the uh, in the survey, the patients are also sharing that experience with friends and family, which yes. is helping all of our providers. And then also over fifty percent of the patients nationally now, as an average, have used a payment program. Yes. So it has become the norm uh, here in the United States. That's excellent. Great stats and good strategy there. That's, I Actually, that, I just learned something. Absolutely. So, excellent. So thinking beyond today and, and kind of in Wayne Gretzky speak, where's the, puck, where's, the, where's the puck going? What do you think we should look out for in a couple of years from now and basically three years? Where's the healthcare industry going to shift Okay, towards? so Justin, you've been in the industry long enough and I've read as well <laughs> to yes. remember the early 2000s when we were all putting in EMRs and EHRs. Yes. And, you know, but most providers and, and health systems had one foot in sort of that digital boat. We knew we had to get all digitized, but we still had all this paper, right? And I, people like yourself would ask me a question, how many years before the paper's gone? Yes. Well, I think the question now is how many years, well, will we still have fee for service? So I think that where it's going is a hundred percent. Call it what you want, mm-hmm. value-based, you know, paper performance, a risk-based contracting. We are headed there. And at the conference this year, I think everybody accepts that. We're all, we're all on that train and the train has left the station. 
what we're trying to figure out now mm-hmm. and in the next two or three years is we all have to figure out what are the best practices to make that successful from technology, workflow, you know, all these new um, tools that we have, as well as payer contracting, you know, even using the predictive analytics yeah. to figure out how can we make better contracts with our payers when we go to risk. So I think that whole journey toward – 100 yes. percent um, away from fee for service it's going to be painful <laughs> it's not going to be easy but it is definitely where we're all headed actually someone could see that's provocative but i love it i actually i agree with you that's kind of the health plan that i helped create here in georgia we, we we've done away with a lot of the the fees um you still have fee for service at some levels but for the most part it all care is included in, a, in a, like a monthly fee and uh, and i i agree it's it's better for the patients a holistic view of the patient it's not nickel and diming, and they can have full transparency on what they're going to spend on their healthcare costs. And like we have it with every other aspect of our life, mm-hmm. we have full transparency in almost everything, um, except for healthcare. So I actually agree with you. I did not, I was not expecting that, but I, um, I love the concept. I think that'd be great for healthcare. It's just how do we successfully navigate that? Um, but I agree with you. It's it's, it's going to be a journey. There'll be a lot of travails. It will be painful. Um, but I think that it is definitely where we're headed to answer your yeah, question. Yeah. One of the speakers at HFMA, um, when asked about when we would get there, which yeah. is the question we always would get, when will we be, when will we be paperless? Yeah. Um, he said it was still another decade away before a hundred percent. And I, I, I would, agree. I would concur. I agree. Yeah, yeah. I would concur. And in a decade, we'll have totally new, uh, technology. So. Correct. Very yeah. true. <laughs> to support the journey. That's right. Exactly. And that, that's part of it. I mean, this, this journey can only be supported. Right. Through technology, through mm-hmm. digitized revenue cycles, yes, through mm-hmm. data accuracy, data access, mm-hmm. and then also to your point, just on transparency. Yeah. I mean, I know actually the White House made an announcement while we were at HFMA, pushing all of us to as as healthcare as a healthcare industry to yes. be transparent about our billing and our charges, and I think we're gonna have to figure out that too. I completely agree. And that's yeah, one it. of the big big news items right now is this surprise billing. Mm-hmm. You go into you go into a hospital and you come out with these bills because out of network, yeah. uh, some a complication has arisen, and you are really stymied when you get out. Yeah, and actually, we've got a couple clients in that space, mm-hmm. and I have learned so much by talking to them that you know because I'm a big patient advocate mm-hmm. and certainly mm-hmm. what patient wants a surprise bill correct but then learning <laughs> the other side of that conversation mm-hmm. is really interesting maybe Justin fodder for a whole other show mm-hmm. yeah well and I agree that, that there's two sides of that coin because I mean I hear it from both sides I hear I hear from the health systems that they don't have all you know all the data they want they they want transparent bills but they don't have access to that data until it's too late they're getting random charges and they're trying to consolidate everything but as patients we deserve it as well we can't budget for our families I mean people cannot absorb a five thousand dollar I mean I have a I mean a family member who um, did stepped out of uh, out of her health plan didn't realize she did and then got a if she had she actually had insurance. But the health system did not accept her insurance, and she's like, "Well, then treat me at just going to do cash pay." No, we know that you have insurance. And this is a local facility here, um, not some of those been on my radio show. Um, but they would not because uh, I wouldn't let them. Be, I don't like. I think this is extremely unfair. They found out that she had insurance. We do not accept that insurance, and so we're going to now charge you three thousand dollars for just to stitch up a finger because wow. she went to an emergency room. Mm-hmm. And but she had full insurance, but they did not accept it, and so she they would not allow her to do a cash pay. A cash pay would have been like eleven hundred dollars for that visit, but because she had insurance, but they did not accept it, it's over thirty five hundred dollars. And that's you know what that's not time- fair. That's just. And you know what? Here you go. So she told you that story. Yes. And now you're telling your listeners that story. Yes. So to the providers out there listening, patient yeah. financial satisfaction is huge. Yes. You know, what if we would have negotiated with your family member and said, yeah. okay, pay us cash. We'll take the 1100 Correct. And she offered that. What a much better it. experience, yes. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what a different happy. story you would have been telling right, right. now. Right. Yeah. And, well, and I gave her the advice because I know healthcare. I know policy. I told her she does not have to pay the $3,500. That $3, you negotiate hard line with them and just walk. Mm-hmm. And and they will they will eventually accept it, but they're they basically browbeat her, and wow. so it was horrible. And yeah. so that's what well, that, that's what we're fighting for. I mean, on the transparency side, that's just not fair. That's a business practice. That right. is not a surprise bill or anything. That that was specifically the hospital's mm-hmm. fault because they would mm-hmm. not. So that we need to get away from. And the surprise bills occur primarily in what you just mentioned: so emergency, radiology, yeah. and anesthesia, and those yeah. three areas. And it's because. 
I think the number is around 60% to 70% of healthcare organizations outsource those functions. Right. Mm -hmm. So your anesthesiologist, right. And Mm -hmm. so as a patient, how do I know Mm -hmm. that that emergency physician is not in my network? I'm going to, it's an emergency. I'm going to go to my emergency Mm -hmm. room that I know is covered by my insurance, but I have no clue about that physician. Right. And I think that onus should be on the hospital because if I go in as a networked person, I'm going to you because you're in my network and then you throw all these non network people at me. Yeah. That ki- that's, yeah. there's something wrong with that. Well, that's a piece that we need. That's, I mean, as a kind of like an, a, just for my audience to educate is you can't, healthcare is different today than it was 10 years ago. A lot of us grew up in, you cannot just wa- drive to the local facility or your closest facility. You have got, if whatever your health plan is, you've got to research it and you have to mm-hmm. know all that fine print. So that's like a public service <laughs> announcement right there. Cause if not, you could very well get a five, ten, fifteen thousand dollar bill that you were not expecting by going to your closest facility. Mm-hmm. It's like when you get on the airplane, they say, Hey, the closest door may be behind you, you know, not just in front of you. Um, you need to look at your, your bill. I mean, you need to look at your health plan and know what your costs are based on the facility that you visit. Cause you could very well get a surprise bill. Yeah. I think the whole surprise bill conversation, I think that for the layman and for people non healthcare, it seems like a very simple thing to solve, mm-hmm. but there are a lot of downside risks as well as a lot of complications. Yep. And I agree with you, Robert. I think the conversation starts with the hospital and all of those physician medical groups that they contract with. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Beth Friedman, co-founder and CEO of Agency 1022. Thank you very much for joining us in the studio. You're very welcome. And thank you for inviting me. You are a terrific guest. And you gave us some fantastic content um, to even just think about. I mean, this was a, a great perspective bring in the financial aspect. Um, so thank you for rounding out our day very, very well. Anytime. Awesome. Thanks, Beth. Why don't you, we're actually going to roll into the hymns preview. So why don't oh, you feel free to stay here at the I... desk? Yeah. Okay. Great. As a hymns veteran. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, and, yeah. No, and Denise I'm, and I chatted in the lobby. I <laughs> saw her on her way out. Hymns annual conference. Uh, I did want to take a moment just to let everybody know it is a, it, if you can go, if you have the chance to go or, or hear my voice now and say, you know what, I'm going to check it out. You know, you will have between 40 and 45,000, uh, industry experts all coming together and, and leaders of all shapes and sizes. And I think that if you're, if you want to grow your world in healthcare, be better at what you do, whether in the healthcare services side or the health IT side or innovation side, uh, HIMS is certainly the place to go. March 8th, actually, is when uh, HIMS starts in Orlando. Certainly book your hotel room soon, if not now, because you want to be close. If not, you can be three, four, five, six miles away, and that's not as much fun if you're trying to pack in a lot. I think some of the topics are what I'll cover really quick. I certainly will get you, I would love to get your guys, your perspectives mm-hmm. as well. Um, but, and I think you've already heard a resounding theme today in this show, but patient engagement, patient empowerment, um, patient enablement, uh, I think are going to be big things and just consumerism, the, the continuous ramp up. And, and, you know, you heard the clinical side, you heard Beth, you talk about the financial side, but it is all about the patient. And we're going to see, I think, much more of that. Um, I, I love that term. The digital front doors come up by half of my guests as well. Really seeing digital patient management and remote patient monitoring and telehealth and pre and post procedure management and, and all that portal management. And you heard even from the government of how integrate all that with the API. I think you're going to see much more of that uh, at HIMSS this year. Um, we're actually going to host a think tank. We're going to host another think tank. We've done that each year. And I think we're actually going to change it up and do a, a think tank live on air. So we're actually going to do wrap the whole radio show around the think tank. And, uh, and have a show similar today where we have, you know, a bunch of CEOs and, and CIOs and C-suite executives and other thought leaders really sharing best practices. So uh, be on the lookout for that. We'll either have it on that Monday or Tuesday of hymns. We're still pulling all that together. Uh, but again, that's why you want to be there in the audience. Uh, you can certainly stream it, but uh, we recommend being there in person. Uh, but then I think also Denise brought up some good points. And all of what Denise brought up is women in health IT. I think we're going to continue to see that theme. Uh, even in her new, new role, she brought up patient experience. Digital, you know, obviously the quest of digital health, we'll certainly see more of that health equity. Um, it's been a, something near and dear to Denise's heart, and I know that uh, it's been a, a big platform for HIMSS. Uh, and so I think you're going to see some more announcements uh, and innovations on that at the annual conference. Social determinants of health, I think you're going to continue to see that advance. Um, and then the positive change in healthcare. She brought that up as a key theme coming up, so she kind of let that one out of the bag a little bit. But uh, the positive change in healthcare and what we're going to see from social programs, what we're going to see in, in innovations. Uh, and I, I think that's great because, I mean, I love positivity. I love to, uh, you know, have the thought leadership around that. And I agree. That's gonna be, if that's going to be a key theme coming in for him, I think, uh, you know, I'd love to see that. So, I mean, what do you think, Roberta? Well, 
Well, a couple of things. The three of us are here. I thought it was interesting because we all go for different reasons. You know, I, um, I'm a press credentialed there and I go and I talk to people for our, our press side. You go, you keep up your certification and you yep. go as, as a, a member. Yep. But Beth here, she has clients and what do you tell them? Why do you tell them to go to HIMSS? Well, That's a great question. Well, you know, certainly it's for the exposure and brand awareness. Yeah. I mean, you've got the collection, Justin, you mentioned the largest group of professionals and now global professionals yes, yes. that are involved day to day with information technology in healthcare, whether it's in a health system, whether it's in a physician practice or medical group, whether it's, you know, a long term care facility or, you know, ambulance, EMS. Mm-hmm. So it really, it's that, it's that collaboration of everybody. In the entire ecosystem of healthcare is there. And if they're interested in any type of technology, that's where they're going to go. And they're going there to look and see what's out there and what's available. So if I, my client has something in that, in any of those spaces, you know, they need to be there and they need to make a presence there. So, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons. And then second reason for my clients is, um, we do their speaker abstracts as a PR company and as a marketing agency. Yep. So I think we submitted six this year, something like that, which is, you know, six of those 900 that Denise right. mentioned. So yes. we're, we're anxiously waiting to see if we got accepted, but mm-hmm. a lot of our clients like to speak at HIMSS. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think if, if you're going to be an attendee and you hear a company executive or a provider that uses a product speak to it, then it's wonderful to also be able to go meet with that vendor after the speaking session. So I, probably those two reasons are the most important for us. And you have follow-up with them. What, what's their experience after? Like, you, I, I think you've had a couple of first-timers. I've actually interviewed mm. some of your uh, your clients there. And we so have. what what is their experience? After the deer in the headlights that they, you know, get over that. <laughs> That's good. <clears throat> what, yeah. um, what, what is their feedback? Well, it's always a journey, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? Nobody, I, I shouldn't say nobody, there's always going to be some exceptions. Very few healthcare organizations are going to go to HIMSS ready to sign a contract. They're going to look at technology to meet with the vendors, to understand what the different companies offer and to sort of compare them. Mm-hmm. So it really is the start of the journey. Mm-hmm. So for our clients, it usually you know, it's it could be in six to twelve months before somebody they meet at Hims might turn into a client for them. Mm-hmm. But it's about that initial relationship building and starting that journey. You know, they always have good experiences. I've not mm-hmm. had any client that's gone to Hims and said we're never going to go again. Once they well, start going, they keep mm-hmm. going. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one thing there, and I'll even follow on on that. Hims is what you make it. That was kind of in my notes. Is that when I when someone says, "Well, why should I, what's the value of Hims?" I'm like, "You can achieve all of your goals going to Hims. It gives you the platform. Now, you may not be able to achieve them because you didn't do a good job executing, but Hims gives you every thought. Most thought leaders of the industry are there. Mm-hmm. Every big player is there. Um, most of the major innovators that are making a difference are there." And so you can get everything that you want out of Hims. Investors are there. I mean, they have. I mean, I think they have seven hundred and eighty in the last the last Venture Connect. Seven hundred and eighty investors. These are huge. The biggest firms in healthcare are all there, um, looking at every the perspective. Government. Yeah, yeah, the government's yeah. there. So mm-hmm. every every thought leader, interested key uh, key interested party is there. And so you can go there and you can do your networking. You can do your education. You can you know get your exposure. Uh, you can learn. I I do it because a we always broadcast the radio show there, but I um I learn. Um, I get to see people that I you know I have maybe hasn't, haven't seen in two or three years or ten years. And you all, you keep you keep your finger on the pulse, mm-hmm. so you really do see how healthcare is evolving, where it's evolving, what innovations are coming up next, what people are achieving. I think one thing I'm excited for this year, and you started to see a glimpse of it last year. And I mentioned this earlier is technology enabled outcomes are really starting to see where the rubber meets the road and where innovation is really assisting care. Uh, and then what, what's, the, what's the outcome of that? Because it takes years for some of this stuff to come into play. And now we're starting to get some of those results. And every year is going to get better. And that's what I think I'm going to you know, experience this year uh, going to him. So, One of the things you brought it up earlier today, Justin, was to see Uber and Lyft mm-hmm. have such a huge presence yeah. at Hims. I mean, five years ago, Justin, if I would have said to you right. that that was going to happen, yes. you'd be like, no, <laughs> no way, right? right? Correct. <laughs> so – and it's kind of, for me, I like seeing these outside healthcare companies making a play in healthcare because I like to see where their mind is, where they think they can assist healthcare. It doesn't always work. We've right. seen a sure. lot of failures, sure. right? Mm-hmm. But, 
it's interesting to see them. Like I just um, heard an interview with the with the health guru at Uber talking about mm -hmm. social determinants mm -hmm. and food deserts. Yes. Well, now can we use these Uber rides to deliver food to the patients that we know can't get to the grocery, aren't getting healthy food? Mm -hmm. Let's make a food prescription and let's deliver it. That's right. Let's deliver mm -hmm. the drugs, not get the patients to the pharmacy, but get the pa pharmacy to the patient. That's right. So saying those disruptors at him yes, is, exactly. for me, it's mm -hmm. kind of energizing, and I find it very – I'm curious, right? So I find it very interesting. Very cool. And speaking of disruptor, Dr. Sylvan Waller, <laughs> entrepreneur, phenomenal uh, – just a long-term friend of mine, but a great in innovator in our town, in our city. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you very much, Justin. Appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. You got it. So we're actually doing a um, – we have about five minutes left of our HIMSS preview show. But uh, but you've been to HIMSS, so why don't you chime in? What do you – why do you attend the HIMSS annual conference and, and we, you know, will you go this year if you have the opportunity? Yeah, definitely. I mean I think it was one of the first opportunities I had to be able to see a lot of different players in the healthcare technology and innovation space. Mm -hmm. um, really interesting for me to be able to see, you know, what new technologies and new companies are coming out. That's, you know, definitely the space I play in. Uh, and so really important to be able to make those connections. And a lot of those connections I made from some of my early hymns, right, when I was much smaller yes. than I was today, but yes. some of the early conferences that I went to, those relationships, both personal and professional, have, have lasted and I've collaborated with many of those people over the years. Um, so super valuable for me individually. It's excellent. That's a great testimony right there. Yeah, this is my 20, this is my 22nd year going to hymns. So not that I'm that old. I'm only... 31. So, I mean, I've been going since I was, what, Your dad 11? was taking you. <laughs> my dad, exactly. I actually did take my son when he was about three years old. So, there you go. Oh, well, that's great. <laughs> Love it. Was it in, like, Orlando or something? Where was it? Remember? I think it was. Yeah, yes, we did the whole Disney a thing fun after. Thing, yeah. Yeah. A fun time. That's great. Um, so, what do you, So, what are your additional thoughts on hymns? I mean, and, and you go every year because you, you have a great perspective as well, being in radio well, and interview. Well, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, our media, uh, going going as press, I, yeah. ha I have to go and um, keep up with the industry. It is the biggest one. We're going to do a lot more radio next year. But yeah, the it, it's the pulse. I mean, when I go there, I go there with three objectives I, that I look at and say, all right, these are the trends coming up. I got to see what people are saying. And then we report on that going out and we keep we keep it like in our thoughts in the pre on the press side, you know, yeah. in there. So it's excellent. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, any final comments or thoughts from you, Beth, or on HIMSS or any, or even H? I mean, even HFMA is a great conference too. We don't mm -hmm. want to forget the financial mm -hmm. component of our of our industry. I yeah, no, nothing. I just on a feedback from HFMA, something very interesting they did this year, and and it had mixed reviews, mm -hmm. but the vendors all got sort of the standard basic booth. Like you had to get your booth from the convention hall. So, you know, when you go to Hims, in some ways yes. it's like a circus, right? Yes, like yes. RSNA is the same way. So bigger and better, bigger and better, but you know, three yeah. story, but it's crazy. So it, you know, I could see. But it, but it kind of homogenized all the vendors. So it was really interesting because mm -hmm. sort of the startup companies right. looked almost just the same as the big guys. That's and right. what it, I think that the end of the day, what it resulted in is many more intelligent conversations about the patterns and trends. It was highly, I would say it was more intellectual wow. than it was sales speak. That's excellent. And I thought, you know, at first I was like curious about it and not sure of being a marketing person. Sure. But at the end of the three days, I actually thought it was a really unique way to think about that. And it makes me, makes me think, could hymns ever do that? I don't right. know that we could. <laughs> I don't know. But, but yeah. it was uh, quite what's, a unique what's take. What's the size? Well, how many people go to that conference? Yeah, maybe um, somewhere between uh, four and 5,000, yeah. something like that. Mm -hmm. But they had, you know, just these, everybody had sort of the same booth, you right. know? Right. So it became much more about the conversation yeah. than about what the giveaway was or the promotion right. or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. it was that they were doing in the booth. I love it. And I thought it was really yeah. unique. And then they, they interspersed the, um, the booths with lots and lots of tables to sit and have conversations. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was fantastic. That's, that's excellent. Uh, and everyone, thank you for joining us today. And please tune in weekdays at 2.30 p.m. Eastern, 11.30 a.m. Pacific to hear our latest shows. And as always, you can track me on Twitter at HIT Advisor and use the hashtag ThisJustInRadio so we can respond to your comments from the show. Thanks, everyone. And uh, tune in next week. Take care.